All right, we're all set. Good evening and welcome to the Westbrook Historical Society's present presentation of what lies above and below the old burying ground. We thank you for spending part of your evening with us. I would like to begin by thanking the Westbrook Foundation for their generosity. Without their support, this project would not have been happened, would not have happened. We appreciate their commitment to helping to preserve Westbrook's history. Um, a brief background about the old burying ground is situated on three quarters of an acre of town owned property located in the center of town across from the Congregational Church. It was used for burials in the early part of Westbrook's history. The earliest stone still standing is from 1739, but burials were most likely started sometime after 1726 when the first minister arrived. And we think most more likely after 1730. And burials continued until the mid 1830s when the lower cemetery on South Main Street opened. After that, there were only a dozen or so burials in the old burying ground, and those were mostly spouses of those who already were buried there. Tonight, we have three speakers. First is Tom Elmore, founder of the GeoNav Group in Suffield, Connecticut. Tom will explain the above ground 3D scanning and mapping using LIDAR technology. Second, we have Doria Petruvis, a geophysicist with over 30 years experience and is the president of Radar Solutions International in Waltham, Massachusetts and also Cameron Russ, also a geophysicist from Radar Solutions. We also have in attendance, hopefully, um, Ruth Shapley Brown, who is the founder of the Connecticut Graveyard Network, who will share her knowledge of old burying grounds. Hmm. And Cameron will be in the background monitoring the questions in the chat logs, and you can type in your questions in the chat log. And if we don't get to them during the course of the pre presentation, we'll get to them at the end in our Q&A portion. We ask you that you mute your microphones and turn your video off of yourselves if you haven't done so already. And this presentation is being recorded for future playback. And if there's nothing else, I will hand it over to Tom. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Um, in addition to what Sandy just said, I do not mind if I get interrupted with questions. So if you would unmute yourself and interrupt me. Uh, and I'd rather address your questions at the time of the presentation instead of an hour later so that they're timely and we can respond with whatever is on the screen at the time. But I started uh, the GeoNav Group, a 3D LiDAR scanning company in 2019. And I'm a trained historical landscape architect, have been practicing for 35 years and got into LiDAR scanning as a means to create base maps uh, for my landscape architecture practice. And it's just taken me to unexpected places. And one area of uh, that I, I have fallen in love with is the ancient cemeteries and working with Radar Solutions International. Uh, the picture on the left is me scanning at the ancient burying ground in Hartford, Connecticut. And that is my handheld LiDAR scanner. Uh, the software I use is Vision LiDAR. It's a, from GeoPlus. It's a company out of Montreal, Canada. And I'm finding that I'm collaborating with a variety of interested parties, and especially those with specialized equipment and software. The image in the bottom right is a plan view, a black and white plan view of the Westbrook Old Burying Ground. So what is LIDAR? LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. It's very similar to sonar and very similar to uh, radar. Uh, it was invented in the early 1960s for lunar and satellite uses. The data is obtained when an infrared laser beam is sent from a transmitter, my LIDAR scanner, reflected off a target, a headstone, and detected by a receiver back at the source again and in the scanner. In short, it measures the distance to surfaces in the environment that are used to create 3D models of that target. It's also called 3D laser scanning. The types of LIDAR and their stated accuracy, uh, you have the airborne mapping with airplanes and helicopters uh, started in about that started in the 60s, 
but in 2003, in the early 2000s, the accuracy was four to six points per square meter. And by 2017, it was 400 to 600 uh, points per square meter. And this is the type of mapping they're using in the Yucatan to find the uh, Mayan cities that are cloaked in the rainforest. It's very similar technology to that used in autonomous vehicles. Matter of fact, the Velodyne LiDAR puck in my scanner is created by Velodyne and they're one of the large uh, manufacturers of LiDAR and a big player in the autonomous vehicle market. You have the unmanned aerial vehicles, U UAVs or drones, and they have between 10 to 100 points per square meter uh, with an accuracy of plus or minus three centimeters. So plus or minus little more than uh, an inch. The terrestrial tripod mounted scanners uh, can pick up 500,000 and more points per second with a sub millimeter accuracy and they can go three to five to 700 meters, uh, but they're also between 200 to $500,000 a unit. And then you have the mobile uh, scanners, which are wheeled, backpack, and handheld. And they range, a varying range from 10 to 80 meters, have approximately a 300,000 points per second uh, gathering capacity with two to three centimeter accuracy and plus or minus 150 points per square meter. The scanner that I have here and the picture on the left is a handheld scanner. It's one to three centimeter accuracy, picks up 300,000 points per second. I did several tests two years ago and confirmed approximately 150,000 points per square meter. It has a range of 80 meters in every direction, the scanner it does itself. On top is a colored camera, has 360 degrees in circumference and 250 degrees over the top. And the camera is used to create colored point clouds, which is a unique piece of the technology for the scanner that I'm using. And because it's handheld, I can really scan uh, quite a variety of unique environments. So why bring LIDAR into the burying ground? Well, it's fast and accurate way to document existing conditions. It's real-time reality capture, meaning it captures data while I'm walking, creates 3D digital twins of the models. And with the software, I can create planes, sections, and elevations. I can combine my data with GPR, ArcGIS, AutoCAD, and other third-party programs. And once it's scanned and in digital format, the use of the data is only limited by our imagination. And Cameron and Doria are finding that last statement to be really true uh, because we, we really are doing cutting edge stuff that did not exist two years ago. So with that, um, Cameron, I'm gonna stop sharing, go to my uh, LIDAR and pull that up and then I'll share again. Um, how do I share again? Uh oh. Chris, so can you see it now? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So you can see the point cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. So what we're looking here for people who are new at looking at point clouds. This is the table stone in your cemetery. Mm. And as I click on that and rotate it, the 3D version of the software comes into sight. So one of the things that I can do with my software is change the background. and change how we see. So this is approximately the view from across the street in the church steeple. 
So the cemetery is approximately an acre in size. When we were out scanning, I scanned it two or three times to make sure that I got a good scan. And what you're looking at is 150 points per square meter over the entire project area. And with the software, I can control um, features that are, we want to look at and turn on and turn off. So for instance, we can turn off the vegetation Ooh. and turn off, let me just zoom out so you can see this, and turn off the off-site features so that we have the cemetery proper <laughs> remaining. So again, turn the trees on. So it's not true color. And, you know, that's just the way the LIDAR and the camera uh, work together. But the software enables me to present it as if I'm flying overhead. But in reality, the scanner is just a couple inches above my head. And, you know, uh, with that, we walk back and forth approximately six feet on center. And that enables us to get all four sides of every headstone. So if I change it from the color to a uh, grayscale, I know, bear with me just a second. we can create that map that you saw early on in the presentation. And then by exporting this file out in formats that Doria and Cameron can use, uh, they were able to take my data and incorporate it into their software. And I was also able to export this data into AutoCAD to create the base map <coughs> in AutoCAD upon which Doria and Cameron we're also able to create some of their maps. Uh, but the software also gives me the ability to, um, to create some pretty, pretty nice cross sections. And if we turn the trees back on, you know, so as a landscape architect, that probably, that cross section probably would have taken four to five hours to create. But again, once we have it in the software, we can create these cross sections and they're to scale within one to three centimeters. And I can't draw that accurately as a landscape architect. You know, the surveys that we get by surveyors are not that accurate. And, um, so that the level of detail that the LIDAR creates really is pretty phenomenal. But for presentation purposes, I do like to present it in color just because it's easier. And, you know, I also like to say that we're not looking at photographs. These are little tiny dots. And so if I zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, so each one of these dots that you see here on the screen, that's what makes up the point cloud, hence the name point clouds, the, the points or the dots. So the resolution is not sufficient enough to read the text on the headstones, but it's certainly good enough to see what which stone you're standing in front of, whether it's a footstone or a headstone, 
Um, there's a stone over here that's lying down. You know, so if I rotate it, it stays on the ground. So it really is pretty amazing, the technology um, and the way that we're able to present data that we really couldn't present a couple of years ago because the technology didn't exist. The scanner that I have came out in the spring of 2018, and my first scanner was number three off the assembly line. And now I'm working with a second generation scanner. So that's all I have. I mean, there's, I could play with it some more, but I guess I'd like to see if there are any questions on what people have seen with the LIDAR and it's, you know, open it up. If people have questions, I, I, I'm willing to answer. And if not, I'll hand the baton over to Doria and Cameron. So let me stop sharing. Right. We'll leave this available for future reference. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, I don't know about you folks. Uh, I never get tired of seeing that. That's pretty amazing. So um, with that, I'd like to <clears throat> go into, um, I presented a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation that will go into the background of uh, GPR and one specific use. Um, just for a little background, um, Tom and I and Cameron have worked together now for, I want to say, three years. And it was kind of uh, serendipitous how we, we found him. Uh, actually, he found us uh, based on some uh, previous work that we have both did independently um, for the Narragansett Tribal Preservation um, Office and other uh, and other folks. Um, so this is a blurb <coughs> that outlines Tom's experience. And um, uh, I am the founder of RSI. Um, I want to thank Cameron, who is also an owner of RSI. Um, he's a very smart young man who has like, elevated what we do exponentially. Um, his GIS background is, is um, second to none. Um, so he's uh, quite the asset and uh, now my vice president. Um, so we can use GPR not just for archaeology, but for other things. And we can present what is below the ground in as 2Ds. Um, so like a cross section, what Tom was showing you, horizontal distance versus depth of a target. Um, but also we can use it for finding things like utilities underground storage tanks, drums, plumes, excavations, all these environmental applications, say drilling a reclamation well. You wanna put it where it's gonna optimize the removal of, of contamination. But we also use it for water supply studies or hydrogeologic characterization, um, as well as you know, geotechnical and infrastructure um, and other applications. So, the uh, we, you know, this is GeoNav's independent um, experience, um, as Tom has alluded to, and um, some of the things that he's uh, we've been involved in together. This is um, a turtle effigy on a, a non not for profit land um, that we're trying to protect, and part of the thing about lidar is documenting. Uh, earthworks and stoneworks of uh, the First Peoples. And uh, another turtle effigy of various other um, stonework images. And some of the projects we've worked together, um, this is just a few, just representative. Um, Three Mile Burial Ground in Haddam. West Long Meadow and the James Arnold Mansion. Now, one of the things Tom didn't mention 
is that his LIDAR is really necessary. It has become a very integral and necessary part of what we do because it helps detect subtle depressions and changes in surface elevation that are um, that aids in the GPR. So what is GPR? GPR is ground penetrating radar. Um, it utilizes microwave, so in other words, cell phone type energy um, down to radio wave type energy. And it puts it into the ground in pulses. Um, these pulses are 100 times less powerful than your cell phone. And the antenna is pretty specific in that it has a shielding on the top. So energy goes into the ground, but doesn't get reflected to the operator. Um, these high frequency waves, they move through the ground like sound waves. And that's because they're at such high frequencies. And they tend to pass through objects that tend to be resistive. And they tend to bounce back off of objects that are, say, metal in composition, or um, they have a different mineralogy or different water content. Um, and of all the subsurface geophysical methods, um, GPR is the best and highest resolution. When the method works, it works great. And um, it helps, <clears throat> like I said, better define uh, what, what you have both vertically and laterally into the ground. However, there are some limitations to the radar. Um, the reflections are non-unique. So you can get an excavation that is high in amplitude. You can get a burial that looks like um, a, an upside down U with kind of little tail sticking out. Um, but that is a similar type of reflection you can get from an underground storage tank or a pipe. So we have to put GPR in context. Um, and this is why we collect many, many lines, you know, parallel lines back and forth. The other thing about radar is that how well you can see and how deep you can see is contingent upon what kind of material you have underground. And the nice thing about it is that, um, you know, burial grounds tend to be in places where people find it easy to dig. So that means GPR signal goes deep and the resolution is usually very good. So specifically for different projects, we can use the, the GPR to measure, you know, to map underground stone works, um, say stone walls that have been buried, um, old foundations, adobe, you know, structures, fire hearths, and anything else of cultural interest. Um, it's also great for finding unmarked burials. Um, and that is because you get a subtle change in density. You've excavated, you put the body in, um, the body decomposes over time. That area is less dense than it is the surrounding area. And so it gets um, very reflective. So um, those are just a couple of different um, aspects of using GPR for archaeology. In this particular case, uh, we use a sensors and software 500 megahertz GPR system. There are many GPR systems. Some are airborne. Um, in other words, the antenna is launched a few you know, feet into the air, such, such as for mapping um, highways and bridge decks. Um, but all GPR systems have a control unit the brains controlling you know, how data is gonna be collected, uh, what spacing you use, what's the resolution you're gonna use horizontally and vertically, how deep you wanna see. It has an antenna. Um, the higher the antenna, the better the resolution. So in this case, a 500 megahertz antenna is gonna have much better resolution than say even a 200 megahertz antenna or a 250 megahertz antenna. The drawback is um, you get less investigative depth the higher frequency you go. Why? Because those high frequency waves get filtered out more easily or what we call absorbed or attenuated by the earth, you know, than the lower frequency waves. And then the third component 
you need something to connect the brains with the antenna. And I'm going to, um, here's my laser pointer here. So this is the 500 megahertz. It's actually a transmitter here and a receiver there. And here's the, the computer. It's just a tablet type of format that's been weatherproofed and the cables that lead back and forth. So it tells you to fire off you know, a signal, which it does, and it's reflected back at areas where you have different electrical properties. So different densities, different water content, different mineralogy. And the antenna pattern, strangely enough, it's not just straight down. It, it kind of broadcasts in this four leaf clover pattern. So this here might be, you know, the transmitted lobe. And that's actually in the case of the 500 megahertz antenna, you're seeing about five feet in front of the antenna and five feet behind the antenna and about two feet on either side. So one question is how the heck do you figure out what you've got? Because you, you're broadcasting over such a large area. And, and how do you determine what the horizontal extent of say a burial is or target. So what we actually see is here's your transmitter, here's your receiver. We're gonna go to the right. So you, it bounces down, it hits say saturated water, bounces back up. And in this case, you have a void space that might be created by a burial. Um, the decomposition, the natural decomposition of the pine box or you know, of the, of the body itself and the, the soil gets loose. And so the antennas over here, it, it has a long way to go to reach out to this target and back to the receiver. So on the bottom here is a, a graph of horizontal distance versus the two-way travel time. And what is that? That's the time it takes to bounce to a target and back. And if your antenna is over here, it's bouncing to this target and back, and it's taking a longer time than when the antenna is moved continuously until you're right on top of it. And then the two-way travel time bouncing to back and forth is gonna be much shorter. So this here is what we call a hyperbolic reflector. It's not so defined as this, usually the tails kind of go off at an angle, but essentially um, it is the reflection from a target like this. And that's kind of important because when we look at radar, we're trying to figure out and identify how many of these hyperbolic type reflectors look like burials. The GPR um, on the screen, it displays data as a function of horizontal distance versus a two-way travel time. And this is a characteristic hyperbolic reflector. However, it's from an underground storage tank as opposed to a burial. It looks similar. And what, in this particular instance, we take a single wave form, a single pulse of that energy, and we color code it. So basically the white is the highest positive reflection. This being, this red line is zero amplitude or perfectly no, you know, no, no reflection whatsoever. And all the way to the left here is negative amplitude. So the gray and the purple are the highest negative amplitude. So it's a 2D representation of a single pulse. And what the line scan image does is it adds these pulses together once they've been color coded. The other thing that we do as far as processing, because you know, the lay person can't really understand what they're looking at by a squiggle or a reflection on a map. And we understand that. Our ultimate goal is to give something to, you know, the, the person that we're working for, um, an image that they can really understand, an aha moment they can see what we see. Unlike Tom's uh, data, we really have to work at it. Um, his his 100, 150,000 scans per, per square meter is pretty impressive. The GPR doesn't have that resolution and we have to deal with the fact 
that the antenna doesn't go just straight down. It, it goes you know, all over the place, five feet, four and a half. So in order to do this, we, we call it depth slice imaging. And I invite people to go to a website called gpr-survey.com. Um, the person is uh, Dean Goodman and he made this program. He is the founder and, and the depth slice imaging uh, algorithms he uses second to none. So what, it do, what does it do? We have here on the left, a single line scan image. It's from a single line in our grid of lines. I don't know how many of you were there to witness Cameron collecting the data, but he set up a grid. He went back and forth, back and forth a lot of times, um, even putting lines in between the grid nodes. And the end result was this 3D assembly of lines. Um, so each individual line is broken into a box. It has you know, a horizontal component, like where you are in that grid. It has, you have information where you are left and right, where that line is. And then also it has information in it where you are relative to depth. And so what it does is it takes each of these boxes and it calculates what the maximum amplitude is for each of those boxes. And then it says, see, this is my line. Then it's going to look in front and in back at adjacent cells within a certain search radius. And then it's going to look left and right at adjacent lines. It's going to look within a whole sphere or semi-sphere in this case um, of where things are located. And then what it's going to do is assign a color to those reflection amplitudes. So here we are looking left and right and up and down. And then now, we are looking at, so red is the strongest reflection and blue is, dark blue is the weakest reflection. So what you're looking here as a metal utility, these are water lines that are connecting. And our client was looking for a leak and they couldn't find where the leak was. So here's the leak. It's near where these two pipes are joining. Here's a little bit of red. White is where we have no data because there were cars parked there. And then this is the plume from the water spurting out at about 2000 gallons a day from the water line. So this is just one example. And I also wanna point out that water is reflective. So a burial trench that has been, you know, that is not native, not, so in other words, doesn't have, isn't as packed. And so it has more moisture in the pores and that should show up very well as a high amplitude reflective area. So the other thing we do, and I'm gonna skip forward on this a little bit, we kind of look at the data once it's been assembled into a 3D volume and we try to ascertain, okay, you know, where's there a hyperbolic? Is that a burial? Could that be a pipe? Uh, in the cemetery we just did yesterday, um, it turned out that uh, we found a water line. <laughs> so. I mean, it's always good to know, you know, how things correlate from line to line to line. Um, your burials tend to be of finite length. Um, so here is an example of a radar gram uh, of an area that was relatively undisturbed. And we were looking for colonial and pre-contact, um, I should say colonial era and pre-contact Native American burials. Um, and the road here was built in the 1890s. So we have a good idea. If the road is disturbed, then it happened after, or at least the embankment from the road. If is it disturbed, we have an idea that, you know, the burial is, is modern. Um, however, if it's disturbed, you know, this layer is, you know, kind of disturbed, then you get an idea that it predates the, um, the road. So here's an example of an ancient burial, pre-1890 at least. And you, here's your horizontal, your ancient soil zone. And then it's missing. It's kind of, you see the downward dipping, the V-shaped reflectors that's characteristic of a, a cut and fill. And here's another burial. So again, we're trying to 
take the, the squiggly lines and try to make sense of it um, and plot it. Here's some more examples, by the way, of other burials. Um, what you're looking at is a plan view image. You're looking down as if you're a bird and you're looking at um, an adobe floor slab that is from about 1150 AD. And you have a very reflective area that looks like that it's from um, a burial. In this particular case, it was known that um, when people pass, the owners of the Hogan um, got buried within them and then they just abandoned the Hogan. Um, this is a stone foundation of a church and they were looking for actually evidence of burials. Um, and inside the church, there are, there's two very distinct um, reflective areas. And that's probably the minister and his wife. This is from the 1690s. Um, and then over here is probably, you know, you're off of the edge of the grid. Um, there are probably some more burials here outside um, the foundation. And this is the um, collapse of the, of the stone of the church and part of the stone foundation. Um, sometimes we present things like this. Um, this was a very early one that we did. I think it's 2004, 2005 um, of all the, you know, look by the visual inspection, looking at hyperbolics or like this. Sometimes we actually get to, you know, see what we find. Or, or some uh, you know, family cemetery, family, family plot that's in the middle of the woods. Um, sometimes we use this information to figure out, can we put, can we repatriate somebody? In other words, um, in this particular instance, um, six uh, Native uh, Americans pre-contact were dug up accidentally and we had to find a place to rebury them. And again, trying to ascertain where unmarked graves are. Uh, this could be a possible uh, mass grave, but we see some order over here. And it can also be useful for finding buried mounds, which could be, you know, where uh, a mass grave or grave of a, of a chief. This is the more recent work. And I alluded to how we use Tom's data. Um, this is a shaded relief map and the darker areas represent where um, there are slight depressions that if you change the sun angle, you can actually catch you know, where there might be depressions that would un, un, un otherwise be, you know, go unnoticed or otherwise go unnoticed. And um, we correlate, you know, Tom's LIDAR data. Is there a depression? Does the LIDAR show a depression versus the radar? Because sometimes the radar is kind of ambiguous. Well, we have a hyperbolic, sort of, we're not sure. Does it correspond to something that looks like it's been previously excavated. Um, so this is the kind of process that, that we do. And what we do is we take, this is a summation of a visual inspection. And then we try to plot it onto, we take Tom's LIDAR data and um, the, the software is getting there. It's not quite there, but essentially, um, using our, our typical graphics um, geophysical software, we can add where we interpret burials, you know, to Tom's LIDAR image, um, or we can have just a residual map. So here are different ways of portraying, you know, these are headstones in the lime green and these red and the blue are um, burials or possible burials. So you can see that there are some areas where there's unmarked graves. All right, and that is it for me. Um, I don't know if we're gonna, uh, should we entertain questions or before we go on to Cameron or? Right. I guess I put you all to sleep. <laughs>
All right, so I'll share my screen now. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat, so. Let's see, here we go. Alrighty. Alrighty. So we'll just dive into the Westbrook Cemetery. I wanna say thank you again for the opportunity uh, to complete this work. Um, here we go into the area of investigation. It's currently thinking. Here we go. All right. So here you can see this is actually a uh, top-down view of the uh, survey area. Um, here you can actually kind of see our survey grid. So Doria mentioned before these kind of light blue lines. Um, that's kind of how we rubber sheet our data onto the Earth and then we survey it in with a uh, survey grade GPS. Um, these cones here were used to actually um, fit the LIDAR information uh, onto Earth. Um, and Tom was then able to create an actual uh, AutoCAD, AutoCAD plan map, um, you know, highlighting the headstones here, which are marked in red. Um, and these blue, this blue line here marks the boundaries of the survey. So. Um, the next one I'm going to show is a series of depth slice images from the site. Um, we're going to be starting from the top, uh, coming from the surface, and we'll be going slowly down into the earth. Um, so you can start to see uh, some high reflective areas. Um, some of these reflective areas due to the time of year might be from just pooled water at the surface. Here we're only about, here we're only about zero to, you know, 0.3 feet below grade, so very shallow. So we're just looking at the surface information. However, these reflective areas though um, are most likely depressions. And these depressions are often occurred due to um, so like, you know, excavations as Doria previously mentioned, as well as, you know, by, you know if you have decomposition, um, it can also pick up on if you had any excavations from them, you know, removing headstones or doing any changes to the property itself. And I'll also pick up on those features as well. And so we're going to keep going down. And so here we can see in this kind of northern section of the site um, that we actually have kind of almost in like a pattern. Uh, we have some of these hyperbolic, these high reflective areas. And these areas are pretty coincident with some of the headstones that are there. Uh, so we can see we actually have some pretty good matchup between what the GPR is detecting and also the location of these headstones, um, indicating that when these headstones might have been moved, that they might have moved the bodies as well with associated with them. And as you can see here, if you look at the depth over, um, where it's 0.8 to one feet now, we're about a foot below grade. Um, we actually have a few more areas um, begin to become more apparent. Um, as you can see, we have this reflective scale amplitude here, um, which kind of indicates, you know, we still have multiple high reflective areas over here. And these reflective areas could also be buried stones. So if there was any kind of toppled uh, headstones that were, you know, covered in the earth, we would also pick up on those as well. Um, you're probably wondering why over in this section to the west, um, why we don't have, we didn't mark any of the reflective zones that we're picking up here. Um, this is actually is like kind of like a pathway. And so the more activity that there is, especially modern activity, it will kind of create false positives. Um, also, these very irregular shapes don't really signify anything of importance as of yet. Um, so we can go down. Um, so as we keep going further down, we still have picked up a few more areas. Um, especially in the northern section, kind of closer to the boundary wall here, and also into the boundary wall here to the east, um, as they are actually, they match up pretty well with many of the headstones that are in this area. Hey, Cameron, um, there was a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. It says, has LIDAR given authenticity to findings from GPR studies of ancient burials? Uh, so yeah, so we actually will have a uh, kind of a slide at the end showing how we overlaid the LIDAR information with the GPR information because you can use the LIDAR to determine like depressions. Um, so yes, the LIDAR is an, a very great tool um, because instead of just using radar to kind of do our checks and balances of what we find in the earth, we have this complementary tool 
to kind of help guide us as well. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, and one thing you can see here um, with the headstones, you actually have like very consistent pattern rest north of cone, cone three here. So this is definitely a, a couple burials here. We have a few more burials that have appeared as well. Um, and then this very large excavated area, you know, this is extremely apparent, very highly reflective zone. And these are match up extremely well with the headstones that are present there, or the footstones. And same here, we also have more apparent burials that are appearing here. One thing we have noticed though, as we are going through these slices, uh, that there aren't as many burials that we're detecting in the middle of the surveyed area or of the, it's, uh, of the cemetery. Um, we still are uh, picking up on more reflective areas and more potential burials up, up in the north and through here, but out through the middle here, we don't see, we don't have as much evidence indicating burials are present. And here we have here, another pattern of burials that coincide well with the headstones that are present, um, as well as over in this section, and as well as this section here, but still very few zones of reflectivity into the center. So we can keep going down. Let's see, at this point, we're about three feet below grade. We start to pick up on a few more features here. as well as in through here, which is actually very interesting because at this point, uh, just adjacent to cone three here, um, this is actually kind of starting to become a slope. It's actually pretty sloped in this zone right about here. Uh, but we are starting to see more burials out through here and through here as well and through here, but still very few burials in through this section here. To take Can shape. We, and at, sorry, and at this depth, you would expect to see uh, returns at these, at this three and a half to four foot depth if there was actual burials there, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, you usually start to see them kind of closer to the surface because right now we're about four feet down. Part of the other thing that happens is um, so if the original burial was, say, even five, six feet below grade. Um, you're actually looking at, um, say, the, the collapse of the of uh, organic material and then the raveling of soil from above it. So you're actually having a migrated, you know, zone of low density material over where the body was. That's why you can see it more shallowly um, the older these burials get. Correct. That's so, yep. And so as in through here, we start to pick up on more areas of reflectivity. But once again, we are about five feet below grade. Um, we're not going to find too much at this point. And once again, most of our burials are concentrated in zones of reflectivity are concentrated kind of just near between cone three and cone four. Um, very few burials were you know, detected around cone six and into the middle. Um, but we were able to detect some burials up through the north, as well as along this section of the cemetery, which um, seemed undisturbed. All right, we're almost at the bottom of the radar of our GPR depth. And so here, what we are showing here is actually the LIDAR imagery uh, so we took the LIDAR information and we created what's called a shaded relief map. Um, thanks to the high resolution of Tom's information, we can actually cr can create a, you know, six inch to by six inch grid and, and determine, you know, di different depressions as they appear on the surface of the earth. Um, these depressions are illuminated based on how the sun will hit the surface here. So we actually have the ability to uh, modify, you know, how the light is actually hitting the surface here. So this is called a shaded relief map. Um, it's used 
for many different applications. You can use it to help find water supply, um, but it's a very great tool in terms of, you know, finding and overlapping the GPR data um, with the LIDAR information. So we can see here, it actually brings up a lot of the headstones and footstones um, that are, are within the cemetery, but we also can see the zones of reflectivity and through here, um, Yep, we would expect to see burials for every headstone. However, um, there was, there is the possibility that these headstones have been altered and moved. So with that said, um, if they have been moved, they could have been moved into a place there was nothing uh, buried there. So they might not have reburied the body. Um, All right, and so these circles here, um, this is actually done. We do, we take the LIDAR imagery, we take the LIDAR information and with the shaded relief, um, by changing the actual light angle, we're actually able to highlight these depressions. And so you can see through here, um, kind of where these ovals are, that we actually can see kind of depressions in the earth, very, very, very small depressions that do coincide very well with some of these headstones. Um, but once again, we didn't find too much evidence in through here, no matter the different light angles that we use to uh, bring out these features on the earth. So then let's go to the next set of figure slides. And it shows that um, by using the kind of the both these methodologies, right, what it kind of use as a check and balance. So um, depending on the time of year when things are collected, um, some of these reflective areas might not be as apparent. However, by using the LIDAR, we were able to detect some of, more of the, some of the burials that are associated with the headstones and throughout the southern portion of the site, um, as well as through the northern portion of the site. Uh, but we do have some good correlation in throughout this area and this area here. And once we're done with this, we actually can take these two informations, two different data sets and combine them. And you can actually get plans like this. So with these plans, you can actually kind of see, you know, you can take this information and actually put it onto the actual earth itself. Uh, so you actually can kind of get a sense of where you are. Uh, in this case, this is the road. Uh, this is the dwelling up in the north. And this is the business property to the south right here. Um, and we can actually see kind of where we have, um, you know, potential burials um, all throughout this site. Um, I do know there was mention of a possible dwelling at some point in the site, um, but it was nothing that could easily be detected um, by the GPR. However, if we go back to this figure here, go back one more. Um, I know in this wooded area here, we do see some kind of lineaments that might be indicative of a possible dwelling, but this is currently forested. So um, there's nothing, nothing we can do in the way of GPR to determine anything that's in throughout, in through here. Um, so let's go forward. Now, do we have any more questions in terms of what we see with the GPR? Actually, close this out. I'm going to go into what's called the depth slice imagery. So, with the depth slices, we have to put them all into a volume, as Doria mentioned before. So, I'm actually going to share this right here. And so, here we are looking at actually at our grid. Um, we're looking at the top of the earth here. You can kind of see the depth up through here. And we're going Cameron, to play this not, at a very Cameron, we're not seeing what you're looking at. We have your old image with the four slides on it. Can you make these bigger so we can see them? Yeah. Let's see if we should. Can you guys see this now? Much better. Thank you. Perfect. So yeah, so this is the depth size image. This is just looking at it in plan view. Um, this is just the grid not rotated into the earth. 
We're also looking at it at a different amplitude scale. Um, so we're gonna go to the top and you can see here as we play this, this is gonna play it almost like a movie um, from the top to the bottom of the investigative depth. Um, we have it going from zero, we're starting at from zero to 0 0.3 feet. So the slice I showed on figure 2A. Um, so we're gonna go to bounce. Cameron, I'm gonna interrupt you for a second. We had another question. Yeah. Do you suspect there are a number of headstones with burials underneath the center, underneath in the center? Yeah, so that is possible. That is something we have um, that has occurred at another cemetery. Um, however, if it's directly underneath the center of the headstones, it's gonna limit the ability of the radar to kind of pick up on that feature. So if, they're, if they are present, it's gonna be a very, very small kind of anomaly. The other thing I'd like to point out, it depends on how reflective something is, depends on the contrast in electrical properties. So if say for instance, there happens to be a little bit more silt or clay in the soil uh, in one area than another, or more moisture in one area than another, you might actually get very, very weak reflections that don't show up with the GPR. That is also possible. Uh, which is again, between that and the non-uniqueness of reflections is why we rely on Tom's information. Yeah, and going back to Bill and saying there's no burials, yeah, it is very possible that there could be no burials uh, underneath when they move those headstones, which is probably why we're not getting any kind of reflections. So we're gonna go to bounce. Well, I would just like to add that in that area, what you see for stones there are foot stones that were put there later um, and they're in, they're in a nice neat row so they can mow around it. But if you go back to pictures from 1920, 1930, those footstones are not there. So that's not a surprise. We pretty much knew that those footstones were not marking graves. Now we didn't know whether or not there was a random grave underneath it. That we didn't know, but that's no surprise that there wasn't anything there. So yeah, so this is the slices and this is kind of how it's presented to us. And then we actually pick and choose these slices to represent. Um, this is actually moving kind of fast. So I'm actually gonna go to the, stop it and go to the top. Um, this is almost like the slowest we can present it. But so we'll go through it each one by one. And you can actually see there's actually a 50% overlap between each slice as we're going down. You know, this is 0.4 to 0.6 feet. So we're still very much at the surface, but we're gonna pick up a few more features as we're going down. And this is actually a good example of why it's important for uh, this information to essentially be rubber sheeted and fitted to the actual cemetery for itself because um, just so you guys can stay oriented, um, this here is the back edge of the property, the Northern edge of the property this here is actually where those trees are to the south. And this over here is the edge of the road uh, near the edge of the cemetery right here. And this is the property, kind of the business to the south. So that's why it's really important to actually have Tom's information. Cameron, um, there was another question. I don't know if you see it. Yep, yeah, I am looking at it right now. Have you had any other studies followed by the actual excavation of the area scanned? Uh, currently, I think, I think Doria can speak more on that. Yep. I apologize, I, I typed it in. But um, basically, yes, we had one Revolutionary War uh, era site that was suspected there was a mass grave um, of soldiers there. And the archeologists followed up on some of our GPR anomalies where there were no headstones and they, they uh, did a trench essentially only about a foot or so down to ascertain and from the staining of the soil, they can actually get a good idea of whether or not it has been excavated previously. Thank you. And so as we're going down at depth, So this is kind of like where the slope is. But one thing that's very interesting here is I know that there was a former dwelling on this property, on the cemetery itself. 
Um, but as you can see here, we actually can kind of see the zone of attenuation, uh, which is kind of what we expect to find if there was an earthen floor of some sort. If it's a stone floor, we'd expect to see it, you know, a very reflective square area, but with it being earthen, um, there's a higher possibility of a very attenuated area. So we can actually almost see like a boundary in through here. And now we really see this kind of like cut out all in through here. And I don't know if you guys can see kind of how sharp um, if there was like a stone wall or some other kind of foundation there from, you know, maybe a previous boundary of where the cemetery once was, this is also another possibility. But out through here in this kind of northern back portion, we can kind of see that there was definitely something that was placed here at one point in time. Um, we can I, see it. Hmm? Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's reminiscent of the 1690 stone foundation. The edges, you know, are uh, the stone foundation. That, that seems... That seems pretty evident. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So this is kind of the only evidence that we have of like possibly finding a potential dwelling at this on this property. Um, but it, it is occur around like, you know, four, yeah, actually since considering it's a footing, it does occur around, you know, four feet below grade or so is when we when this feature is, becomes more apparent. Um, but you can see the different kind of reflectivity in these high zones all throughout here. I know it doesn't uh this is the first step, right? When we have the grid and then we have to then convert it. So the GPS, so then we have to then rotate it all so it'll all fit onto the earth. So as we step down, the same. And this is the edge of the road. This is a property to the south. These are the trees and this is the Northern back edge of the property. And there's takes a quite a, quite a lot of processing to get to this point because this, the first, set of depth size images we showed was essentially the raw information. So um, we're not, you know, filtering out any kind of, you know, noise or anything at that point. But yeah, and so even right through here, let me step back, we can still start to see that kind of boundary become more apparent of where that could have been where the dwelling once stood. It becomes significantly more apparent right through here at about four and a half feet down. Which I think might answer the cemetery's question of where the dwelling uh, once stood, but it does take quite a bit of processing to essentially find it. But now does anybody have any more questions or anything they'd like to share? Aaron, I have a question. Does your software give you the ability to locate that presumed foundation? Or would we take this information back into the LIDAR to get some measurements? Yeah, so we would have to either put it back in the LIDAR, but the, also another thing we can do is just uh, plot it onto a map as well. Because that hey, may be if something you, if that you, you like. I'm sorry. If you step back to the original raw data, um, I think that has uh, less smoothing. Um, we're uh, at about four feet or so where you start seeing that straight edge. It almost looks like, yeah, see, so um, that diagonal line um, looks like that it's the northwest edge of uh, the building there. And as you scan down, if you go down uh, next couple of deeper slides, slices, I should say. Yep. Especially like there. Yep. Um, the f now, I wonder if it's higher elevation wise uh, to the northwest than in the central portion, because that might explain why the foundation is shallower. Um, at the shallower depth slices. But by taking uh, those two images of where the northwest wall is and where um, the southeast wall is located and putting them on your LIDAR map, 
we can precisely tell you where it is, you know, with the GPS coordinates. So, so Sandy or anybody, do you guys have any more questions or? M Melanie has a question and I'm not sure if I uh, understood it. Melanie, do you want to unmute yourself? <laughs> yes, I was just wondering once you um, have done your studies and presented the information to a community, I'm just wondering if there's, it's probably different everywhere, but I was just wondering what people do with the information or how they respond or how they share it if, if it's interesting to a wider community. Well, one thing that we have Tom do uh, because he is more geared to doing it is plotting up the LIDAR and the GPR combined images on an 11, and a half, 11 by 17 tabloid size page. The issue is that this is a very static way of presenting the information. Whereas these depth slice images and uh, say cloud compare, which is a open source uh, program that will take the combined Tom's data and RSI data um, and you can zoom in or zoom out. So, you know, where to go from here is you have these electronic images um, and you know, if the town procured um, a tablet that was powerful enough, um, you know, 64, you know, gig of, you know, memory uh, RAM or whatever, um, you could actually take this out into the field and kind of look at it, um, you know, carry it around and navigate to the, the spot. Um, we don't go away. You know, we're, we're not going to say, here you are, you're stuck with, you know, what we're never going to, you know, you're never going to hear from us again. Um, we want people to reach out to us um, if they have any questions or need, you know, say, for instance, if we have to um, answer um, some person from the town, well, what software should we buy? What kind of computer should we buy? What's the next step? We're willing to talk with them about next steps. So, um, you know, it's a process and we're learning. Um, the software is being pushed to the extent um, we've, we've both, both Tom and I have gone back to our vendors, our software people and said, you got to do better. You, you have this glitch in it. You can't do this. We're looking for this. Um, and they're working on it, you know, just like we're working on furthering things. So even in another year, you know, both the software and the presentation will have, will have progressed. Tom, um, can you pull up your CAD drawing with the um, red ovals on it? No, but uh, let me figure out how to find the PDF because I have my CAD on my other computer. Right, that PDF, yes. Yep, um, bear with me a second. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say it's been a long week, but it's been a long month. Um, so, yes. Um, so I have it up. I just need to figure out how to share screens. Um, yeah, all right. And we had a question from Kathy. Can we specifically go back to look at the distur there's disturbances near the office building that are looking into the cemetery rather than out of the, out with the ideas as to what they might be? Um, so Kathy, would you like to like look at the specific uh, kind of depth slice? Maybe we should have them out unmute themselves and speak. Yeah. yeah. I think that would be more efficient. Cameron, can you walk me through? Oh, here we go. 
let me uh, let me just show this drawing here. Can you see that drawing, the AutoCAD drawing? Not no, yet. you get to share your screen, Tom. No, I thought I did. Nothing's happening. Oh, maybe that button. Now, can you see something? Yeah, but you see your see your files. Okay. So here. Um, I don't think. Yeah, or clockwise. I think that top one. Yeah, one more here. There we go. Um, so in this case, old Clinton rolled us to the no, south. We're not Tom. Oh. You got to share your screen or or share the specific CAD file. We're still looking at yeah. You, yeah. So go share screen and then uh, it should say screen. That. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, in this situation, north is to the right. Here's the house. We have old Clinton Road here. Here's the business. So this is the CAD drawing, a compilation of the LIDAR data. From the LIDAR, we did the CAD drawing, sent our data to, or our files to Cameron and Doria. They processed their GPR data. Um, Cameron gave us a map that you saw earlier with the ovals on it. And then we pulled that information and applied it to um, the clean, crisp AutoCAD drawing. No interpretation on our part. All the interpretation was based on Doria and Cameron's uh, assessment and evaluation of their data. So Sandy, did was there something specific you wanted to look at here? Well, I, I just think that this is a better visual for pe some people, but you can see most of the headstones are going um, east to west. And then yes, right there, we have some unmarked graves, seven of them going in a different orientation. Yeah. So, you know, our task is to try to figure out why. I mean, somebody was asking, what do we do next? Well, the next thing we do is we actually look at this map and I'm looking where your uh, pointer is down there that we have unmarked graves there. We have some that are, uh, we have some headstones that there's no burial. So we'll look and we'll see where these people lost at sea. Did they die somewhere else that we don't expect a burial there? So there's a lot of research that's going on. We're, this is just a starting point for us to go ahead and start looking at everything. And if you notice, like even down along Oak Clinton Road, some of the stones are at the head of the grave, some of them at the foot of the grave. So we know there's been a lot of movement in the burying ground. Mm -hmm. And of course, where this is located by the Boston Post Road and this old Clinton Road, before 1925, that Boston Post Road wasn't there, that didn't exist. There was a house actually sitting there. And when they put in the road, that house was split and moved over where the business part is. So there's, so on the fringe of the a burying ground, there's been a lot of activity. So we'll have to look into a lot of things where graves moved because there's a bunch of stones um, by the tablet there that are, are older brown stones. The stones are there, but there's no burials in here. What happened to them? That's the question. Yeah. When they when they widened Old Clinton Road, did they move something? When they when there was uh, when they did that with the Boston Post Road, we don't know. But where that business is, that was pretty much uh, an empty lot. But certainly, you know, that, that these are things that we have to look into. And like I said, yep. in the center there um, were a lot of footstones. And yeah. so it, this what's great about this, it kind of solidifies what we kind of thought that they weren't marking graves. So it's a great tool. It's it's it, we're going to be using it a lot. I don't and know if right anybody in, else. And right in here is the slope, going from high down to low. Which, you know, so right Cameron, where the so you think the building was like where Tom's circling? Oh, uh, here. Yeah, probably. Oh. Like, 
Yeah, I think like kind of up like up through yeah, kind of right where Tom is right now. Yeah. Oh, okay, because I thought we're okay, because I thought the orientation you had was was okay, different. He he rotated it. His is yeah. rotated 90 degrees to the right. Yeah. And also like the way the uh, slice is currently, it's technically like that grid is facing relative north, but not true north. Um, so it'll just have to be can plot it out and submit it. So we were in this area here, Sandy. Remember this wall was parallel okay. to this? It was in here. Um, so it had, yeah. So I mean, it's interesting because that would predate those graves there. How old is old Clinton Road? Um, old. <laughs> Kathy, can you unmute? It was pretty much like main road. So it went, you put, that's probably the road you took if you wanted to go into Clinton as, as opposed to like where Boston Post Road is. Mm -hmm. I Kathy. know that um, in other areas I've surveyed, um, they either modernized the road um, and expanded it at the same time, um, in which case some of the um, colonial burials from the burial ground um, actually were in the road and the fence got moved. They, they moved the whole uh, stone wall for the colonial burial ground, but unfortunately they didn't move the burials oh. <laughs> so they're that... underneath the road. <laughs> yeah, well, so because... that could happen too, I suppose. Well, and if you notice like along Old Clinton Road, there's there's a stone wall there. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, you know, when they put it there, were there were there burials in front of it? I mean, there's a sidewalk there now, they put trees. It's possible to find out. Possible, but you know, I don't think you can do anything because now there's sidewalks and they've dug down enough. Yeah. Three or right. four feet that you probably wouldn't be able you wouldn't be able to gather any information there. Right. Now, um, as far as tree roots, how does that affect your data? Oh, depending on the tree roots, we pick them up too. <laughs> um, I was doing some one uh, one site at Fort Shantuck um, at the uh, Mohegan uh, Reservation, the Mohegan Tribe property and I got the nice root system of the cedar trees. Um, so it was hard to find uh, post holes where the uh, enclave was, you know, the Palisades were from the old fort. But um, it also depends on, has it rained? What's the soil like now? Because um, the roots retain the water a lot more than, you know, than, than uh, say a wedding front. Um, so in the summertime, you know, if it just rains, it just soaks up the water um, and the roots really stand out, you know, compared to the rest of the soil. Um, but again, GPR is a method of context. So we expect the roots to be fairly shallow. We expect burials to be deeper. The other thing we look for is those telltale, you know, V-shaped reflectors that would show that it has been excavated and backfilled. Do you have any more questions or? Somebody had a question before I fired this map up. They wanted to see one of your previous. Yeah, Kathy uh, wanted to see something. Yeah, I think it was those burials that you pointed out um, that were unmarked. The seven burials? Yeah, as you're going through the various steps, those holding. I don't know if that's good. Oh yeah, definitely, Sarah. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, there's no other. Uh, I don't see any questions here. Kathy, if you want to unmute and, and ask your question, or if it hasn't been answered. No, no, no. 
All right, we have another question. How long did it take to acquire all this data? Um, all right, so to acquire the GPR, the LiDAR data took a day, correct? Yeah, I was on the site probably two, two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and for the GPR, it was about a day and a half to two days, I'd say like about two days or so. And then there's a lot of office post-processing work to be done. Typically speaking, for every hour in the field, Tom, you do what, about 10 to 20 hours of data processing? Yeah, yeah pretty much. And more heavily rocky site, it goes up exponentially, yes. And I know for the GPR, for every hour on site, um, it's usually four plus hours in the office. And it can be more depending on, um, you know, how good the radar data is. Uh, Sandy, I am on, I'm off mute. Sandy, I do not see Ruthie. And I, I, I don't her, either. Yeah. I tried calling her three times while we were on and there's been no answer. So um, so we'll have to catch up with her at another time. Yeah, and we'll be talking with her and I'm sure we'll be brainstorming with her as far as uh, what we see. I'm sorry that she wasn't here because she's very interesting to hear and, and talk about the orientation of how they bury people, um, just their practices back then. Uh -huh to kind of take your, your technical part of it and kind of put it more into a historical context is, is what we're gonna be doing next. And it's that's the interesting part. So many communities have um, similar issues they're, they're facing. And I wonder if there's like an organization where, where you know, people from various towns can talk and, you know, talk about what they're doing and the problems they're facing and how they solve them. Um, yeah, I think that would be taken. Yeah, Ruthie would probably be the contact point on that. But we know that there's been, you know, activity in that graveyard. Um, you walk into it and it's like, you know, something's not right. And of course, with the invention of a lawnmower, they wanted all the headstones to be nice and straight. So they could have moved them then to straighten them out. Right. So it's just, it's just very interesting, you know, whether they've, you know, flipped these headstones, whether they moved them and for, and why. I don't know if we'll ever get the answer to that, but you know, we'll be we'll be searching for answers. And I think you're right. I think the lawnmower did have a lot to do with it. I know that the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, putting people to work, did a lot of improvements to cemeteries and other landscapes, and they actually started the process of moving footstones. Um, you know. Right, because it, you know, originally when they buried people at, in this time period, it was it was pretty much random. Um, it's not like once you got into the 1830s, you had more cemeteries that were planned out. So they may leave a space for a spouse or something, but that's why they had the footstones and the headstones, so they knew where not to bury or where somebody was buried. Right. And once they stopped using the cemetery and they start bringing the lawnmowers in, the footstones didn't matter anymore. In fact, they were, they must have been pulled up. We have rumors that some of these were sitting in a, in a house in their basement and they were using them as shelving. And so at some point they probably decided to put them back in the uh, cemetery and they, they chose the middle of the cemetery where there wasn't anything. We have an, uh, another question from Kathy. Uh, could you tell if there are any burials at the tabletop gravestone area? Um, 
from what it looks like with the GPR, one of the issues with getting too close to the tabletop is we didn't want it to uh, like disturb it and by, you know, accidentally bumping into it and hitting it. Um, so that's one thing too with like headstones, you know, we don't, as with the GPR, we have to, you know, walk very gingerly and really take our time out there because we do know a lot of this stuff are, a lot of these headstones and footstones are in such fragile shape. So unfortunately we didn't, I didn't get it close enough. Well, we did get around it, but it doesn't appear, um, doesn't appear like any burials associated near the tabletop. Let me see here. Yeah, from looking at the GPR, we didn't detect any kind of burials near the tabletop. But once again, we were kind of going very, uh, very gingerly throughout the site to make sure we didn't damage any of the headstones when we were there to not touch them. Um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see where this information does go. I'm looking at the, the questions, the string that Melanie started with regard to sharing the information. You know, this is the fourth or fifth historic burying ground that we've worked on together with this combined technology. And there's a lot of interest in it. And so I don't know where this will take uh, the GeoNav Group and RSI, Radi Radar Solutions International. But I can tell you that the technology is improving and the software is improving. Um, one of our goals is to get the ground penetrating radar data into my software so that when I start doing my cross sections, I can show the above and below ground with the, the kind of software and the manipulation that I can do. And we're getting closer um, on a regular basis for that. We're not there yet, um, but I know that there'd be a lot of interest in that. But, but carrying the data forward, you know, uh, Melanie, we were out with you yesterday on the Cape and I shared with you how good the scans came out and considering the soil conditions, you know, you're gonna have pretty good GPR data as well. Um, so it'll be interesting to see when we start combining our data, what, what it really looks like versus what we were thinking we were seeing in the field. Yeah, I, I, I was quite surprised to find um how reflective the actual burials were um, after, what, 170 years, something yeah. like that. But, uh, and the sand also preserves, um, you can see the disturbances, you know, quite well. And we were that, also asked to, to bring our technology to the ancient burying ground in downtown Hartford. So I did some scanning there, but when Doria found out about the high clay content and previous GPR work didn't show anything because of the, the clay content. You know, at this point, there's really no advantage to doing it again um, because you're, you're, we're not gonna get what we would like to get. Well, the, the only difference I would, I would say is I, um, I can't recall who was the one who did the GPR survey there. I wanna say it was the city but I'm not sure. So we're the only ones in New England that actually does the depth slice imaging um, because we find it a really important tool. And yeah. even when the results are absolutely terrible. So for instance, we're trying to find a sewer line in the middle of a highway. The highway has road salt on it, very conductive. And we're not seeing very deep, maybe about three, four feet. But yet, with the depth slice imaging, we can see the excavation, the trench in which it's located. Okay. So it's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. So I would say that, you know, I don't know when they did yeah. um, that, that investigation, but the technology has improved, so the hardware has improved, but also the depth slice imaging is a, is a tool that uh, unfortunately not many people in the GPR industry actually use. So. Oh, okay. Uh, and then Laurel, Laurel brought up a good point. A good central network might be the Association for Gravestone Studies. 
especially their uh, monthly e newsletter. Yeah. So thanks, Laurel. I'm going to copy that and put that in. And Sandy, I'll send her comment via an email to you. Um, Well, I should be able to save the chat log, correct? Uh, correct. But, all right. Well, I want to say thank you again for the opportunity to complete this work. Um, does anybody have any more questions? Or? And Sandy and Kathy and whoever else is still listening, um, you know, we are only a phone call away. And we're really committed to what we do. We're not going anywhere. So please do reach out to us with questions or, you know, and some interpretation if you if you need something more. Well, I just want to thank Tom and Cameron and Doria. This has been fantastic. You're easy to work with. I mean, this is gonna be great as we go along. And we're gonna, you know, refer to this a lot. Good. Yeah, and definitely feel free to reach out. Phone call is always the best. As you know, we're our, we're kind of everywhere. So I, I got your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Phone call is always the best, I will say. So excellent. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Thank Have you. a good night. Have a good, Have a good evening. evening.